morning. The flowers that grace our sanctuary today were placed here in memory of Lystra Balois by her family, uh, the Medeiros family. I have found a reading in one of my old uh, books from university that seems to me to be particularly appropriate to this day. It's called Patient Trust by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet, it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability and that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on as though you could be today what time, that is to say grace and circumstances acting on your own goodwill, will make of you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. Let's pray. Lord, in this age of anxiety and stress, we ask for your presence to be made clear among us. Be with us as we confront illnesses that leave many of us in a state of worry for our families, our friends, our colleagues, our communities, our nation, our world. As hospitals and healthcare providers seem to continue the healing ministry of you, may they have the fortitude for the road ahead, knowing that you are walking on this journey with them with your mighty hand. Remind them of both their strength and your strength. We ask for your comfort to be upon those who have already lost loved ones during this time of viruses. And may healing be upon those who are physically suffering and spiritually suffering through this season. May the wilderness of this time and the uncertainty we may feel strengthen our resolve to lean on your word, abide in your presence, and be guided by your enduring and powerful spirit. You have been with us in every age and will remain our refuge to take solace, to recollect our thoughts, to remember that all the, th all the things of this world are fleeting, and this too shall pass. Amidst the darkness and the confusion and the storm of worry, may your presence be made abundantly revealed so that your light, your hand, your strength gives us steadiness, refuge, clarity of purpose, and hope. Amen. We are reading today in the book of, uh, first book of Samuel the prophet. This story takes place during a terrible war. Goliath, the Philistine giant and renowned warrior, leads the enemy troops, and all of King Saul's best soldiers are afraid to fight him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and, and ever possibly win. You're just a boy. And, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and, and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to lions and to bears, and I will do it again to this pagan Philistine. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. Oh, all right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. 
David put it on, strapped the sword on over it, and took a step or two to see what it would be like, because he had never worn armor before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from the stream bed and put them in his shepherd's bag. And then armed with only a shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the carrion and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to the attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and Taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine square in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell with his face to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Thank you. For the last 14 months during this pandemic, we've been thinking a lot about how to deal with fear. Fear, we learned today, can easily be overcome with just five smooth stones. Today we heard the story of the shepherd boy David and the five smooth stones. It, it's when young David takes on the formidable giant Goliath with no armor and no weapons, just, just his sling and five smooth stones. You see, David had spent years tending his father's sheep, and during that time, he learned the skill of hurling stones with his sling. Imagine the daily ritual of watching over the sheep. It probably was mostly boring. So David had to do something with his time for entertainment. What he didn't know at that time was that God was preparing him for the day when he would face Goliath. In fact, we know that David had already taken out lions and bears in his service of protecting the sheep long before the day that he came face to face with the giant Goliath. 
While the rest of his men were dreadfully afraid of Goliath, David had faith that the Lord would deliver Goliath into his hands. King Saul was hesitant to let the boy David face the Philistine. He, he reluctantly agreed and offered his armor to David. But David would face Goliath with just his sling and those stones. Five smooth stones that he took from the brook. His staff in one hand. And, oh yeah, God was by his side. And you all know how the story goes from there. David rushed towards Goliath, took one of the stones from his pouch, put it in a sling and slung it, and the stone sank into the Philistine's forehead. Boom! And then for good measure, David cut off Goliath's head with the giant's own sword. This story has been inspiring people through the ages, giving us a reason to believe that with God at our side, we can take on the giants of the world. But it all goes back to the gospel, doesn't it? You see, when our enemies come our way, when storms blow through our life, we tend to be fearful and anything but courageous. At least that's usually true of me. But God incredibly uses David. David was just a boy, small and weak and a sinner just like all the rest of us. And David, David knew that he needed the saving grace of God just like you and just like me. He needed to act boldly and out of faith. And we are facing giants in our time, aren't we? COVID-19 certainly is one of the giants that we're facing right now. A year ago, it seemed like an indestructible giant. Even as we began our lockdown at the end of December, it looked like this would never be defeated. But, you know, there are more giants than COVID out there in our world today. Our lack of faith, our impatience, our selfishness, these are all giants that threaten to overcome us. But we all have our five smooth stones. Look at these stones. I have five of them sitting here. Over time, these stones have been worn smooth by the forces of nature. You know, these geological processes are called weathering. These stones found their way to the bottom of a brook where the water rubbed them together and rolled them over against each other for a really long time, making them smooth and rounding off all their sharp edges. I believe that in this day and age, we human beings are the stones that God is going to use to defeat the giants. The Lord shapes us by his natural processes, like David's fighting off the animals that attacked his sheep. Like these stones, we are being shaped by the rubbing and weathering that we, that we deal with by rubbing up against each other. And we're shaped to take on the giants that take, come across our path through the power of Jesus Christ. Let me share with you the five smooth stones that have become the foundations of my life. The first stone is my attempt to speak only with integrity, to mean what I say. I try to stay away from gossip and negative talk. Because in Ephesians, Paul tells us to speak the truth, but speak it with love. The second stone in my arsenal is that I try not to take anything too personally. What other people say and do is a reflection on them, not on me. The Bible tells me that if I allow the Holy Spirit to come into my life, I will know the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that I pray other people will see in me one day. The third stone that I try is that I try not to make any assumptions about anything, and particularly not about people. If I want to know something, I ask. We make assumptions about so many things in our lives. We think we know, but we don't always. 
There was once a person who assumed that she knew me well enough that she could finish my sentences for me. And unfortunately, she almost always got it wrong. And she never really knew what I was thinking. And, and it became a really sad wall between the two of us because I, I became convinced that she knew nothing about me at all, even though she really thought that she did. And so I try really hard to listen to what other people tell me and ask for information when I don't understand. The fourth stone is that I always try my best. Whether there are 10 people here in front of me or, or 100, I, I give the same effort. Some days are better than others for getting my best accomplished, but I always try. For me, this comes down to my relationship with God. I, I constantly try to give Him my very best. I try to give him my best in my worship and in my singing. I try to give him my best in my service in this community. And I try to give him my best even by the way that I dress. And this final stone, this is the one that I believe that David used in his sling. Remember, he, he had five stones, but he only used one. This is the one. This stone represents our faith in God. Faith is an expression of our hope for something better. And it's more than a wish. It is a belief that is rooted deep in our hearts. Remember, God created us to live in a community with one another. My five smooth stones are a reminder of this to me. They are all focused on our living peacefully together. The next time you come across a, a stream bed filled with stones. Think about them all rubbing up against each other and about you rubbing up against your brothers and sisters in Christ. About the stones that you keep in your arsenal and about the unwavering faith of David the King. Our faith in your power and your provision for us, O oh God, is strengthened today by our reflection upon the experience of, of David in his encounter with the giant Goliath. You reminded us that there is nothing in all of creation that is more powerful than your word in all of its two-edged glory. By it, Jesus calmed the storm. By it, he healed and made people whole. And by it, we too are being sustained from day to day and from minute to minute. Help us, O oh God, to cling to your living word and to root ourselves in it, that we may be a people who overcome all the trials and tribulations that come upon us. We are reminded today, O oh God, of how the strong can be defeated by the weak, how the exalted and the mighty can be overcome by those who are humble and lowly. 
and we give you thanks for this. We pray, O oh God, for all of those today who are oppressed as Israel was oppressed in Egypt. We pray for those who must contend with forces greater than they. Grant them faith, and in faith grant them courage. Act for them, and in them bring them up to liberation. God of all mercy and compassion, of grace and reconciliation, pour out your power upon your children in the Middle East, Jews and Muslims and Christians, Palestinians and Israelis. Let hatred be turned to love, fear to trust, despair to hope, oppression to freedom, occupation to liberation, that violent encounters may be replaced by loving embraces and peace and justice can be experienced by all. We pray today, O oh God, for all of those who live in fear and insecurity, for those who need encouragement, for those who need our help and the help of their neighbors and their communities if they are to know life in all its fullness. And Lord, we pray today for all of those struggling with COVID-19. In these days of COVID-19, we pray when we aren't sure. God, help us to be calm when information comes from all sides, correct and incorrect. Help us to discern. When fear makes it hard to breathe and anxiety seems to be the order of the day, slow us down, God. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't reach out with our hands. Help us to be socially connected when we have to be socially distant. Help us to love as perfectly as we can, knowing that perfect love casts out all fear. For the doctors, we pray. For the nurses, we pray. For the technicians and the janitors and the aides and the caregivers, we pray. For the researchers and the epidemiologists and the investigators. For those who are sick and for those who are grieving, we pray to you today. For all who are, are affected here and everywhere around the world, we pray for safety, for health, for wholeness. May we feed the hungry. Give thanks to give drink to the thirsty, give clothes to the naked, house those without homes. May we walk with those who feel that they are alone, and may we do everything we can to heal the sick in spite of the epidemic, in spite of the fear. Help us, O oh God, that we might help each other. And in the love of the Creator, the name of the Healer, and in the life of the Holy Spirit that is in all and with all, we offer you our prayers today. May it be so. And let us continue with the prayer that Jesus himself taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And when this is all over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger conversation with our neighbor, a crowded theater, Friday night out, the taste of the communion cup, a routine checkup, the school rush in the morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, every boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we want to be, more like the people we are called to be, more like the people we hope to be. And may we stay that way, better to each other, because we have been through the worst. Go now in peace. Never be afraid. Wash your hands. Love your neighbors. And know that you are not alone.